Hey, this is Father Steve, uh, Episcopal Ch Ch Priest, <laughs> serving uh, two Episcopal churches in Western Washington County, Maryland, St. Thomas's Episcopal Parish in Hancock, Maryland, and St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Clear Spring, Maryland, both of these churches in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. Um, new setup, I've actually moved the recording studio um, out of the basement of the parish hall of St. Andrew's in Clear Spring to my office here at St. Thomas's in Hancock. It kind of works out better and maximizes my time and the limited amount of time I have to, to do uh, what we're doing. And also uh, those who are watching our YouTube program, myself and Father Bobby, um, that they may be one, uh, we will be recording next week uh, from here. Right now there's an empty chair here. Uh, reason why we have not recorded in a couple weeks is Father Bobby was in Scotland and England and and uh, I was away on vacation one of those weeks that were away. And this week he came back from Scotland and, and uh, had a lot to do to catch up. As we know, the church work is, always goes on. So, uh, but we will be using, um, when we're, I'll call it on campus, be recording here. And of course, you know, uh, if you watched our YouTube program, that day may be one, we take our show on the road. So, but anyway, this is um, going to be the Bible study. Um, uh, uh, it, welcome to use it. Uh, it's St. Andrews in Clear Spring. We're now doing uh, that mysterious book, uh, Revelation, the Apocalypse. Scary, scary stuff, right? And then uh, we're going to be doing a Bible study here and at uh, St. Thomas's uh, beginning on the 17th of September. So um, anyway, uh, it may be a 22-week uh, series. And uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about, uh, I, I'm calling it the mysterious journey of uh, Revelation. Okay, so let's take a look at that, a little bit, a little background, and then um, I'm going to go, have some questions here out of a, a book uh, that uh, I'm using. And um, those who are used to me being in my other recording studio, you see me looking this way, I'm now looking this way at, at my monitor. So here we go, a little bit of... Um, uh, background again, I'm Father Steve, the interim rector here at St. Thomas's Episcopal Parish in Hancock, Maryland, and also I'm uh, the priest, the vicar of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Clear Spring, Maryland, uh, serving a two-point charge, and I'm just loving it. So, so let's begin with that uh, mysterious book, Revelation, and I'm, I'm going to a little, little reading here out of my notes. Be mindful it is Revelation, not Revelations. That's important. It's revelation. It's not plural. It's not revelations. It's revelation. Many people choose not to read or study revelation. For some, it's confusing. For some, it may be frightening. And for some, both confusing and frightening. So here is my plan for this Bible study. To do probably a 22-week Bible study series on revelation, maybe it will t not take that long. However, I want us to spend time with each chapter. With that said, I only want us to read one chapter per week, not to go ahead, not to be ahead of the appointed lesson plan. So try to stay with us. I want us to do this together. And the best way is for all of us to stay together on the readings and follow up questions. There may be weeks where we will do more than one chapter. The first lesson on Revelation, uh, which is now, will be a little background on Revelation, and I'll be reading from several sources. Also, the main book for our study Revelation, besides the Bible, of course, is Revelation 22 Studies for Individuals and Groups by N.T. Wright, the, the For Everyone Bible Study Guides by InterVarsity Press, Downers Grove, Illinois, 2012. And this is the book that we're, uh, a lot of will be coming out of. For those who do not plan on following us after this first lesson, I encourage you to purchase this book. So some background revelation before we get to reading chapter 1 and do some questions. And my sources are these. I use the Jerome Biblical Commentary, an introduction to the New Testament by Raymond E. Brown, the NRSV version, New Revised Standard Version, the New Oxford Annotated Bible, and as mentioned, N.T. Wright's study book. Okay? So, so Revelation, the apocalypse, follows a style of writing that means unveiling, or the things that are not known now, but will eventually be revealed. So there's much uh, predilection or sim for symbolism. Predilection is a special liking of symbols. So that's what we have in Revelation. So let's talk about some of these symbols that we will see. 
Woman represents a people or a city. Horns speak of power. Eyes, knowledge. Wings, mobility. Trumpets, the hearing of a superhuman divine voice. Trumpets. A sharp sword, the word of God. White, white robes, world of glory. Psalms, sign of triumph. Crowns, dominion and kingship. The color white, joy of victory. Purple, luxury or kingship. We know that from Jesus. And black, death. And there are also some symbolic numbers in Revelation that we will see. The number seven, we see that 54 times means fullness, perfection, complete. Twelve, the number 12, 23 times recalls the 12 tribes of Israel and means the people of God have reached their eschatological perfection. The number four, 16 times, symbolizes the universality of the visible world. Also worth mentioning, as far as numbers go, the number three, we have that 11 times. The number 10, 10 times. And 1,000, we see that six times in chapter 20, often in multiples. Okay, so a little bit more. Although there are possible disagreements as who or which John is mentioned, most scholars assign the authorship to the Apostle John. It is also good to know that because Revelation, the Apocalypse, is the last book in the canonical text does not mean it was the last book to be written. Some scholars put 2 Peter after Revelation. Now Raymond Brown, one of my sources, writes this about Revelation. Raymond Brown says this, the book is popular for the wrong reasons. For a great number of people read it as a guide to how the world will end, assuming the author was given by Christ detailed knowledge of the future that he communicated in coded symbols. Brown goes on to say, The 19th and 20th centuries have seen many interpreters of prophecy who use calculations from Revelation to predict the exact date of the end of the world. And up to this moment, all have been wrong. Finally, Revelation was written by John while banished to the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Now let us begin. What I'd like you to do, I'm not going to read it now. I'd like you to do, and the other thing too, during this Bible study and using this format, I ask you to, if you want to pause it, hit the up, down, equal sign or, or whatever that, there's two lines. Hit that, go and read chapter 1, and then come back and hit the arrow, and then do it again to stop it between the questions. And my questions are going to come from N.T. Wright's book. Now is the time if you want to take and go in and pause this video and read chapter 1. Okay, welcome back. So I'm going to open up with Jesus Revealed um, from N.T. Wright, and N.T. Wright writes this. Some years ago there was an eclipse of the sun. These things happen rarely enough, and to witness it is a great experience. But staring at the sun as it slips behind the moon and then emerges the other side is dangerous. If you look through binoculars or a telescope, the sun's power on your eye can do permanent damage. It can even cause blindness. On this particular occasion, there were public warnings broadcast on radio and television and printed in the newspapers to the effect that people should be careful, only look, they said, through special dark lenses. Eventually, one person, who obviously had very little understanding of natural phenomena, got cross about all this. Surely, they thought this was a health and safety issue. A letter was sent to the London Times. If this event was so dangerous, why was the government allowing it in the first place? Fortunately, even the most totalitarian of governments has not yet been able to control what the sun and the moon get up to. But the danger of full power sunlight is worth contemplating as we hear John speaking about his vision of Jesus. So, again, I'm going to throw out some questions to you and pause, give you a chance to discuss, and go back and hit the arrow to move on to the second uh, question. So here's the first question. Read Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Read this again. Who is this book all about? 
and what do we learn about him in these opening verses. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to just kind of continue on, but remember if you need to stop and pause, you know how to do that, right? Yeah, you do. Okay. Second question. What does it mean that this book serves as a testimony or witness? And that's in verse 2. Third question, a little bit longer here. Even in the short opening, John manages to unveil a good deal of what he believes about God and Jesus and about the divine plan. God is the Almighty, the beginning and the end. Other lords and rulers will claim similar titles, but there's only one God to whom they belong. What other lords in our own day make competing claims to the almighty status that, as John testifies here, in reality belongs to God alone? Kind of tough question. But try to tackle it. The fourth question, read Revelation chapter 1 and read 9 through 20, verses 9 through 20. Where is John when he writes this letter, and why is he there? What happened to him? Why was he put there? I've already said that once where he was, but why was he there? The fifth question, why would this be important to John's original readers? Why would this be important to John's original readers? I have 12 questions, so uh, let's... Uh, Kind of stick this out. The sixth question. Exile has given John time to pray, to reflect, and now to receive the most explosive vision of God's power and love. How have you experienced God's power and love in the midst of a painful or distressing situation? Think about that. How have you experienced God's power and love in the midst of painful or distressing situations? And sometimes it means being by yourself, but other times, most times not. The seventh question, what does John see when he turns to find out who is speaking to him? That's verses 12 through 16. What does John see when he turns to find out who is speaking to him? All right, eighth question, long reading here. I'm going to give you a, it's a long question. This vision of Jesus draws together the vision of two characters in one of the most famous biblical divisions, that of Daniel 7. There, as the suffering God's people reaches its height, the Ancient of Days takes his seat in heaven, and one like a son of man, in other words, a human figure, representing God's people and, in a measure, all the human race is presented before him and thrown alongside him. Now in John's vision, these two pictures seem to have merged. When we are looking at Jesus, he is saying we are looking straight through him at the Father himself. Why is it significant for us that the one who represents humanity and the God who rules above all come together in the person of Jesus? Now this question uh, if you want to come back to it later, maybe, you know, something might say, we're going to come back to that next week. You could do that. It's kind of a, it's kind of a long generating discussion. And I know that I'm throwing these questions out. If you want to skip ahead, um, I know there's a time frame as far as Bible study, uh, as far as adult education, um, especially um, if you have a, the Eucharist coming up at 11 o'clock and, and you're um, just getting to the church and you don't have as much time, maybe skip through a couple questions. That was question eight. Question nine. A few more here. What is John's response when he sees this vision of the one like a son of man in the midst of the lampstands? Lamp That's verse 17. Our tenth question. Why does Jesus emphasize that he is the living one who holds the keys of death and Hades? That's verses 17 through 18 of chapter 1. Two more questions. Seven is the number of perfection, and seven churches listed in verse 11 stand for all churches in the world. 
all places and all times. The seven churches need to know that Jesus himself is standing in their midst and that the angels who represent and look after each of them are held in his right hand. How might this vision of Jesus in the midst of the churches have comforted suffering believers in the first century? And our last question. How does it bring comfort to us today? So I have a prayer here, um, and T. Wright has a prayer here, so let us pray. Hold a picture of Jesus in your mind, detail by detail. Let those eyes of flame search you in and out. Imagine standing beside a huge waterfall, its noise like sustained thunder. Imagine that a noise as a human voice echoing around the hills and around your head. And then imagine his hand reaching out to touch you and his voice speaking the words, do not be afraid. Take comfort in his presence. Give him thanks for revealing himself to you and ask that you might have eyes to see him as he truly is. Amen. So there we are. This is an introduction to Revelation, that mysterious journey. Um, I'm reading chapter 1. Uh, I'm Father Steve, Episcopal priest serving uh, St. Thomas' Episcopal Parish in Hancock and also St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Clear Spring, the two western churches of Washington County, Maryland. God bless.